Hi, and welcome to Space Week for Monday, December 16th, 2019. Last Monday, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine spoke at the Artemis Day event at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. He announced, The SLS core stage complete. Indicating that principal development on the large orange central first stage of the long-awaited space launch system rocket is finished. SLS will be used to launch the upcoming Artemis missions to the moon and to set the Europa Clipper spacecraft on a Hohmann transfer trajectory toward Jupiter. Bridenstine also addressed some questions from the press, including a tricky one regarding sustainability and reusability. This, this rocket is not reusable, though, correct? Um, That's right. So at what point would NASA consider go moving toward reusability in a Moon and Mars rocket? Very soon. So what this rocket enables us to do is launch the Gateway, which is a reusable command module in orbit around the Moon for the next you know, 15 years. And we would like to see the Orion crew capsule have elements of it be reusable really by Artemis IV, by the fourth launch of, of the Orion crew capsule. There are other rockets that we believe one day will be available. So maybe they'll be able to launch a landing system that we can aggregate at the gateway. By the way, that landing system also, the goal for sustainability is have the landing system itself be reusable. Again, remember, we go back to Apollo, it was not sustainable because the cost was too high, and, and it was too high because everything got thrown away on every mission. So what SLS allows us to do is ultimately have sustainability to, to launch the capabilities that will in fact be reusable, but it itself isn't reusable. So parts of this rocket will be reusable, I should say, more so than in the Apollo era. But the architecture that it's gonna be able to deliver is the key to the sustainability aspect. Every NASA administrator has to walk a fine line between keeping the public happy regarding how American tax dollars are spent and keeping Congress happy so that the funds keep flowing and thousands of their constituents can stay employed. Bridenstine's speech came just four days after a dramatic and successful stress test of the SLS's 149-foot-tall first-stage liquid hydrogen tank test article, in which an excess of nitrogen gas was pumped into the tank, and large hydraulic pistons delivered millions of pounds of compression, tension, and bending forces to the tank over a span of five hours. Finally, the tank ruptured violently, having withstood 260% of the expected flight loads, providing SLS with a very comfortable durability margin. Uh, we test things to destroy them so that they're so that we're safe. People are like, "Oh, don't tweet that out because we don't want to see some people don't want to see something blowing up." I'm like, "No, people want to see things blowing up. <laughs> That's what they want to see." It just so happens that in this case, it blew up at 260 percent of the load, which is a good thing. Last Wednesday was launch day, with no less than three separate rocket launches within a few hour time span. First was the Soyuz 2.1B with Fregat upper stage, which lifted off from Plesetsk Cosmodrome in northern Russia. It delivered a GLONASS-M navigation satellite to medium Earth orbit about 12,000 miles or 19,000 kilometers high. 85 minutes later, an Indian PSLV rocket launched the RISAT 2BR1 radar Earth observation satellite for ISRO, India's space agency, as well as some commercial small sats. Then came the ninth commercial launch of Blue Origin's unique New Shepard suborbital rocket, which thrusts straight up to an altitude of 151,000 feet, or 46 kilometers, and a max of about 2,200 miles per hour, or 3,600 kilometers per hour. New Shepard's booster then separates from the payload capsule, whose momentum continues to carry it for another two minutes, up to an apogee of about 343,000 feet, or 104 kilometers, just past the 100-kilometer Kármán line that designates the official end of Earth's atmosphere in the beginning of space. This gives about four minutes of continuous weightlessness for the capsule, much longer than the 30 seconds provided by a parabolic flight in the Vomit Comet. This allows microgravity research to be conducted for a fraction of the cost of an orbital launch to the space station. 
The booster then returns straight back down to propulsively land itself a couple miles from the launch pad, similar to a Falcon 9. The payload capsule descends on parachutes and fires retro thrusters at the last moment to cushion its landing, similar to a Russian Soyuz crew module. Blue Origin plans to start doing human flights on New Shepard for wealthy enthusiasts as soon as next year. You may recall a couple of months ago I talked about the Sarge sounding rocket from Exos Aerospace that failed shortly after launch. Exos has now determined the cause. A composite part just below the nose cone failed, causing the nose cone to slide down into the rocket. The rocket lost its aerodynamics and turned sideways to its doom. What's strange is the composite part was a fresh replacement. Engineers saw some moderate signs of stress in the part on the previous launch, so they chose to install a brand new part. Unfortunately, it still failed, and this time they don't have any data to tell them whether it was a buckling failure or a weld crack. Sometimes, even in aerospace engineering, you have to make an educated guess. In last week's episode, I talked about the ongoing series of spacewalks by Luca Parmitano and Drew Morgan to repair the alpha magnetic spectrometer on the space station. During spacewalks such as those, there's a phrase that either the astronauts or Capcom keep saying that brings us to the term of the week. The phrase is glove and hap check, or alternately, hap and glove check. A spacesuit is essentially a self-contained spacecraft. It provides environmental protection, mobility, life support, and communications for the spacewalker. It's pressurized with 4.5 psi of pure oxygen, and it has a liquid water cooling system that regulates temperature throughout the suit. Back in July 2013, Luca Parmitano was on his second spacewalk when he noticed that water was accumulating in his helmet. Hey, Luca, can you clarify, is it increasing or not increasing? It's hard to tell, but it feels like a lot of water. Oh, I see, uh, I see it now, wiggling. A clogged filter had caused the suit's cooling system to back up, resulting in a dangerous leak. Luca could have drowned had NASA not cut the spacewalk short and returned him to the ISS. Since then, NASA added an emergency oxygen snorkel and a helmet absorption pad, or HAP, to the inside of the helmet. The HAP is just an absorbent pad which will absorb any water that happens to leak into the helmet. NASA now requires spacewalkers to perform periodic glove and HAP checks to make sure that no air is leaking from the gloves, since spacewalkers use their hands for everything, and that no water has been absorbed by the HAP. Looking ahead to this week, there's a lot going on. Today, Monday, December 16th at 2.30 a.m. Eastern, 7.30 GMT, before this episode of Space Week premieres, China presumably launched two more Beidou navigation satellites on a Long March 3B with Yuanzheng upper stage. Later on Monday the 16th at 7.10 p.m. Eastern, 12.10 a.m. GMT on the 17th, a SpaceX Falcon 9 will launch the JCSAT-18 Pacific-1 communications satellite up to a geostationary orbit over the Asia-Pacific region. SpaceX had a successful static test fire of the booster last Friday the 13th. They'll be using the same first-stage booster that launched the CRS-17 and CRS-18 cargo missions to the ISS. Make sure to catch that live stream here on Raw Space. On Tuesday, December 17th at 3.54 a.m. Eastern, 8.54 GMT, an Ariane Space Soyuz with Fregat upper stage will launch two satellites into a sun-synchronous polar orbit. The first Cosmo SkyMed second generation, or CSG-1, radar surveillance satellite for ASI, the Italian Space Agency, and the ESA's Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite, or CHEOPS, which will observe transits of exoplanets around their stars to measure their radii. On Thursday, December 19th, at 10.21 p.m. Eastern, 3.21 a.m. GMT on the 20th, a Chinese Long March 4B will launch CBRS 4A, a China-Brazil Earth Resources Satellite for environmental, urban planning, and agricultural imaging. Then on Friday, December 20th, at 6.36 a.m. Eastern, 11.36 GMT, is the Biggie, the long-awaited orbital test flight of the unmanned Boeing Starliner CST-100 crew module to the International Space Station. Starliner is Boeing's contribution to NASA's commercial crew program to send humans to space from American soil again. SpaceX's Crew Dragon is the other participant. Starliner will ride atop a ULA Atlas V rocket with two solid rocket boosters and a dual-engine Centaur upper stage. Starliner begins its rendezvous with the ISS on Saturday the 21st at 5 a.m. Eastern, 10 GMT. 
It docks three hours later, and the hatch will be opened another two hours and 37 minutes after that. There will be live coverage the whole time. It'll stay on station for one week, returning the following Saturday. I'll have those details in next week's episode. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. As always, feel free to like, subscribe, and activate notifications if you don't want to miss anything. If you enjoy content like this and would like to help out, there are Patreon and PayPal links in the description. Space Week is also available as an audio podcast at rawspace.podomatic.com and on iTunes at tiny.cc spaceweek. See you next time!